world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Welcome everyone, wherever you are, to this online session of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. 2020's event certainly going to be remembered as different by necessity, but we won't let a pandemic interrupt the joy of reading and hearing from some of the brightest and best authors and poets that we have at this time of year. We're still going, we're still talking, we're going to have some fun. Now, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Claire English and for many years I was very lucky I was able to host a book programme for BBC Radio Scotland. I've been in a news uh, journalist capacity, uh, politics, arts, current affairs, you name it, I've done it. So my range of interests is pretty vast, but I will absolutely seize any opportunity possible to talk to writers. So it's really wonderful to be with you today. And I am really thrilled to be in the company from a weird little Zoom box <laughs> from the great, the great Kathleen Jamie today. She is uh, one of our finest poets and essayists, professor of creative writing at the University of Stirling. Give us a wave, Kathleen. Yes, we're live. This, she talks about the Scottish landscape and culture, constant themes in her work. So that's going to be interesting to talk about today. But today, Kathleen's actually doing something else. Um, she's adding another string to her bow because ordinarily she'd be writing, but now she's curating and editing this gorgeous book that we're going to be talking about. Antlers of Water, we'll hear a little bit more about that. All life is in here. You're going to enjoy it. Red Deer, Walking, Wasps Back Gardens, yep. Uh, also joining us virtually, two other terrific contributors, uh, writer and journalist Chitra Ramaswamy. Chitra's first book, Expecting, The Inner Life of Pregnancy, came out in 2016. I think I'm right in saying Chitra. Lovely to have you with us. Have any dogs or children appeared yet? <laughs> no, but I've <laughs> got a big bag of washing at the door to, to keep them out. Excellent. Very disappointed to see that Mr Potato Head has been removed from the background as well. <laughs> And finally, um, at first sight, perhaps it's a bit of an odd one, so an unexpected contributor, I can say here, but it all makes perfect sense when you see what she's written and how, and when you see what she does with her art. Her concerns are the landscape and nature and how we are located and how we locate ourselves in the world. I'd like you to meet visual artist and writer.
writer Amanda Thompson. Amanda, how are you? It looks gloriously sunny where you are. Where are you? It's gloriously sunny. Yeah, Fantastic. Lovely. Where are you? I'm just outside Nethy Bridge, near kind of in the highlands of Abernethy Forest. Doesn't sound too bad. Well, this is all very strange, but I think you'll agree this is a very impressive, and I have to say, all female lineup. So I'm very delighted about this. So here's the plan, team. We're going to have a chat. We're going to get some readings, and uh, we'll get some questions. I'm going to ask you lots of questions. You can ask each other questions if you want to too. And then I'm going to get some questions from everyone that's watching, everyone out there. Please don't be shy. Get the questions in and ask them anything. They are ready for it. Let's start off with uh, the curator, Kathleen. Um, this is lovely. Have you ever done anything like this before, Kathleen? No, I've never edited a book before. How was it for you? Best project ever. Right. Yes. Explain to me why, because I would think, oh, how frustrating, because I'm not writing, but there's oh, oh. I, all sorts oh. of challenges trying to pick the best people for the oh. book. That was the joy of it, not having to write that, you know. <laughs> other people did that for me. You know, it was one, it, it was something I'd had in mind for a, a few years now. And when the time was right, um, I asked Canon Gate Press if they were interested, and they said yes at once. And so I drew up a list of contributors. It took me 10 minutes. Took you, you know? 10 minutes, really? You knew who you wanted? Sorry? You knew who you wanted then? I knew, I knew who they were. Uh, and there were others who I couldn't include as well, but uh, I knew they were out there. That was the point. I knew this, um, how to put it, there was a Scottish nature writing out there, but nobody had brought it together and said, this exists. And I'd be watching with envy the crime writers, you know, <laughs> they did it. And I thought, no, we can push Scottish literature beyond that, you know, and we can explore whether there is a, a uniquely Scottish nature and environment writing going on by us, the people who live here. Yeah. You so it was simple. No. Do you think this is a, a sort of special moment for nature writing because we are all aware of how fragile we are on this fragile planet of ours? Increasingly so. You know, nobody had heard of COVID when we started this, but um, we had certainly seen a resurgence and a reinventing of nature writing, not term alike, but we're obliged to use it, over the last 15 years. When I started out doing what's now called nature writing, you know, it just really didn't quite exist. I didn't know that's what I was doing. But now 15 years on, the bookshelves are full of it. We've got prizes, we've got PhD theses, we've got events like this, you know? And that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years, which now I'm old enough to think that's a short time. <laughs> you and me both. But there's such an amazing range of nature writing. Maybe we've got it wrong that we've got an idea of what nature writing is. And maybe this shows us what it isn't and what it can be. Yes, I think so. We're all, we're all in the natural world, whether we deny it or not. We are all natural, whether we deny it or not. And I wanted to bring in a, a nature writing which was diverse in the sense that I wanted it geographically diverse and I wanted it diverse in the way of what people were understanding of what nature is, you know. Hence, including things like um, nuclear pollution in the Firth of Forth or watching wasps in the back garden if you have mobility problems, you know, we have these things in here. And it absolutely is not about striding over the moors and reporting back to the, the denizens at home, you know. So many of us live in, in urban situations. I wanted to bring that in too. That, that, was, that was a joy for me, actually, just seeing the urban settings as well. And we'll find out more from Chitra because she kind of addresses that. But before we go on, it's a beautiful title, Antlers of Water, but it's a bit familiar, so you can explain why. <laughs> I'm glad it's familiar. It's a line from Norman McCaig. And when I was thinking about um, a possible title, A, you go to the poets, they'll never fail you. And B, Scottish nature writing, go to Norman McCaig. So... On the shelf behind me is the collected poems of Norman McCaig. Wow. I got that book down, opened it at random. Antlers of Water. You know, it's the last line of his poem, looking down at Glen Canis. And I thought, thank you, Norman. Oh, it's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift. Uh, I'm going to get you to jump right in, actually, uh, because you've done the introduction to the book, which is beautiful. So, Kathleen, if I can get you to read a little bit from that, or as much as you want, go for it. Yeah, I'll read a couple of short sections. It's a short piece, though. I'll read a couple of these sections from it. The idea lingers of Scotland as a place of lochs and bends and Faroe islands, a wild and romantic place where one may forget our human travails. Even if that was once true, it's not now. There can be no one who has not heard of climate change, which we now see rapidly changing the world around us. No one unaware of the mounting levels of threat facing wildlife through habitat loss and want of food. No one can be unaware of ocean plastic and chemical pollution. 
Our writers are fully cognizant of environmental crisis. They don't pretend it's not happening, but they're not prophets of doom. 21 writers and two visual artists were asked to contribute to this book. All responded at once with great enthusiasm. All responded, I believe, out of love of the world and our particular part of it. They're not offering escapism. They know it's not possible nowadays to escape into nature and find temporary relief from some other real world, far from it. The natural world, the world that birthed us and sustains us, is where the biggest and most frightening changes are happening. What the writers in this volume are doing, in their very different ways, is meeting the challenge of finding a way of speaking and writing, witnessing and celebrating as they continue to love the world, its landforms and plants and creatures, even as we navigate a crisis. The natural world is not here as a painted backdrop to our human concern. It is our human concern. Here is Antlers of Water. There are in Scotland more writers and activists than are published here. A new generation of Scottish writers is already emerging who will soon be making waves of their own. Stags, wasps, eagles and barnacles await you. Islands and rivers, windowsills. We invite you to read not as passive recipients, but as an active participant in this vital work, this noticing. If by reading you're encouraged or confirmed in your love of the natural world, if your interest is piqued, if you're inspired simply to put the book down and look outside, then our job is done. When we read and write, when we love our fellow creatures, when we walk on the beach, when we just listen and notice, we are not little cogs in the machine, but part of the remedy. It's lovely that you read that. And just uh, when you said, you know, when you put this book down, if you just look outside and notice, and that's exactly what I did. I followed your prescription. I was sitting in the study of my house and outside, it was pretty sunny, remarkable, Glasgow, but there you are. And uh, I, just, I just stopped. And then I heard more birdsong in the next minute that I was sitting there and I thought, that's what we all have to do. And I guess we're getting more mindful because of this pandemic as well, that we are able to just take a break, step back. And it is about the noticing, Kathleen, and it's training yourself to notice as well and doing it more regularly. Yes, many of us just started up a huge lawnmower. Can you hear that? No, <laughs> I noticed that. No, I didn't notice that actually. Oh no, we can still hear you, which is great. Let me, I'm gonna to go to Chitra and to Amanda now because it's lovely to be included in something like this, but did, did she have a hard job persuading you, Chitra, first of all? Um, no, definitely. I was one of the one of the ones who instantly replied with uh, with great enthusiasm. But I did. Um, I, I suppose I had to check myself a little bit because I would never really identify as a as a nature writer. Um, I have to be honest, I'm one of those people who doesn't really like to identify as any one thing in particular. Um, and that's what I really love about this book and about uh, Kathleen's kind of curation of it and and the kind of nature writing that Kathleen does as well which has been hugely uh, inspirational to me um, as a writer and it is about this idea of you know the old kind of separations that maybe existed you know when I was growing up the idea that you know you were going to go into the countryside there seemed to be this kind of barrier between you know urban life and country life and um, I would definitely have felt, you know, growing up as I did in uh, southwest London, that the that nature and the countryside were, were places that were not for me and places where I felt completely like a fish out of water. So, so there's something quite lovely about, you know, however many decades later, finding myself um, pitching up in a collection like this, um, as in some ways, I, I'm not a nature writer, but I actually like to think of myself a little bit as a as a human nature writer, um, which I think, you know, again, those separations, they don't stand anymore because, you know, we are living in the Anthropocene and this world, we have impacted upon it in such a way that I don't see those divisions as, as existing anymore, if indeed they ever did. Mm. Amanda, what about you? Did you have to have your arm turned and persuaded heavily to do this because you are an artist. But then when I look at what the range of what you do with your art as well, multimodal stuff, experiential, it doesn't really surprise me. No, and I mean, I absolutely jumped at the chance. I mean, first of all, it was um, Kathleen whose writing has kind of sustained me for years. Um, 
you know, incredible writing. And then, then she threw in Antlers of Water, which is, you know, um, a line from Norman McCaig, who's kind of, I think, has been one of my first kind of literary, literary loves from when I was at school. And then this, just this idea of, you know, what Church is saying, what is nature writing? What's really interesting about knowing I was going to be part of a book, but absolutely not knowing what else was going to be in the book. You know, just that question of the different perspectives and also backgrounds that people came from that contribute to the book. So I think what's really kind of exciting about being part of the book, it, it answers some questions, but it opens up a lot more questions. And that's what's really exciting about where you where you, where we all cite ourselves in relation to nature, what the relationship of nature is. And as you know, Kathleen's right, it's not going for kind of 100 mile kind of hikes into the very interior of Scotland. It's a wasp's nest in the garden, it's flowers, it's, it's all these different things. And sometimes it's the micro things that you begin to notice. And there's things in the book that I will pay more attention to next when I go to the coast for example so it's it's all these different smaller things that just bring out all these questions about what is nature what is nature to me but you're an artist you observe so it's just an extension of what you do every day isn't it absolutely and I you know I, I teach um I teach at Glasgow School of Art and I teach in the painting and printmaking course and I'm, I'm primarily a printmaker I would say but I've always made artist books and one of the things I've always found interesting is how you find the form to fit the idea. You know, and that can expand all the way through any kind of creative endeavour, to writing, to poetry, to making art, to photography, to, you know, all kinds of different things. So it was, it was, it was a lovely challenge for me to think about writing. It's a gorgeous gem of a book. I'm not just saying that. I got surprised because I wouldn't have thought myself being somebody that would have picked up a nature book, but it's not what you expect. That's what's so gorgeous about it. Yes, says Kathleen Jamie, punching the air there. My, my job is done. But Chitra, you've got three meditations in this book. You've got three stories in this book. Um, why did you want to write three? Did you get told you could do as much or as little as you wanted? Well, it was a completely open remit. Um, it literally was, you know, writing on uh, the nature, uh, the environment and, and nature of, of Scotland from people who live or have lived there. And I, I live in, uh, in Leith in Edinburgh and I've lived in Glasgow for 10 years. So I, I've always lived a very kind of urban um, existence. So I knew for a start that, you know, I would be writing from within that place. And then the kind of strange thing, talking about this in the midst of a pandemic, but having written it pre-COVID, is the way that I decided to go into this um, was that I decided to approach it philosophically, thinking about places that I haven't been to, as opposed to places that I have been to. Um, and the reason I did that was because I'm at a sort of stage of life where I've got very young children. Um, I haven't got that kind of freedom that I maybe have had and that, you know, I hope I will have again um, to, to kind of strike out in that way. Um, and also, as both Kathleen and Amanda have said, you know, nature writing is becoming something quite different as we sort of weigh it up alongside our responsibilities um, in terms of living in a, in a climate emergency. So, I started to think about the fact that, you know, I haven't actually left this country. I haven't been on a plane for nearly a decade. Um, the only place I really go is either London to see my family or we go north um, and we holiday in Scotland. And so I decided that I would do kind of three meditations on places that either I haven't been or, or things I haven't quite seen or, or this idea of absence um, mattering as much as presence. And now, of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic where, you know, we, we can't really go anywhere. Or if we are going places again, they're kind of fraught with, uh, with tension and, and risk and responsibility. Um, so it ended up being quite quite a prescient thing to, to focus on. Absolutely. I think you're going to do a reading for us and I'm having a debate about how to pronounce your beautiful, uh, Paul Devane, we think it is. It's Gaelic. Somebody will correct us, I'm sure. Tell us where this magical place is that you didn't get to. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, I decided to open with a, a walk that I, I kind of failed to complete. Um, and it's in Applecross. And the thing, the reason I was interested in Applecross is because I think, you know, it's a, it's a particularly beautiful and sort of cherished peninsula and it's so hard to get to. And um, it's this very famous old drover's road that, you know, I think everyone will know so well and um, that it kind of crisscrosses up the mountain. Um, and it's now part of the North Coast 500 uh, and the feel of that road for people who have loved taking that road for a long time, it's changed quite dramatically. So again, it felt like this place was both kind of inaccessible. It's always going to be hard to get to because some places just are stubbornly hard to get to um, and remain so, but, but in other ways, you know, it's part of this kind of tourist route now. Um, and also I happened to go there when I was, you know, really heavily pregnant with my second child and um, we did that classic thing of we, we decided to do this walk to Ardban, this, uh, this beautiful beach and um, we just decided to do it as though we were not the people that we were so you know heavily pregnant we had our son with us who was a toddler and just you know moaning the whole way. Can't even imagine and, how um, gross that was in parts really it must have been hellish. <laughs> It was fine. It was, it, and, and also, I, the other thing about this particular opening essay is that I wanted to find a way to write about race and, you know, this being such a kind of integral part of my experience as a writer and also my discomfort in nature. Um, and it's both part of being a very metropolitan person, but also by virtue of my race of not really seeing people who look like me when I do go to these places and feeling, as I say, kind of not exactly at home there. And um, I didn't want to write about this in a really explicit way, but I thought I'll try and write this first section, um, this first of three essays, and I will only mention it once. And um, but I hope that that one line kind of fans out um, and says something about how you know, whenever people of colour venture into, into these places, or often when we do, um, that, that is always part of our experience as well, for good and, and bad. Okay, are you going to do a little reading for us then? Yeah, I'm just going to read from the very start of the essay, um, and I think it's probably just going to be, I don't know, a couple of minutes, something like that. Go wild. <laughs> Not too wild, but wild. <laughs> Looking back from the vantage point of right now, it occurs to me that the walks we don't do might be as significant as the ones we do do. The road's not so much less travelled as not travelled at all. After all, absences matter in nature as much as they do in life. Recesses, glens and corries are as much a part of the total mountain as Nan Shepherd so satisfyingly called it, as its ridges, brays and summits. I'm thinking specifically of a walk I failed to do in the late spring of 2017 when I was seven months pregnant with my second child. We were staying in Applecross, that most contained and possessively loved of Scotland's peninsulas, as much because of how it's reached as what you find when you get there, and how it is reached. Via the Bilach Nabar, a historic drover's road crisscrossing the mountains with the precocity of a ribbon gymnast's ribbon. A dizzying sequence of hairpin bends, more alpine than Scottish in spirit and gradient. It seems old to us, but is as close as our last breath next to the millions of years the mountain has on it. The Bilac, by comparison, was laid in 1822, the same year the Caledonian Canal linking Scotland's east and west coast through the Great Glen was completed. Walter Scott's land of the mountain and the flood was opening up to the world, to people, cattle, and to the bold and entitled Victorian idea of touring, of going places just for the sake of being in them. Almost 200 years later, we pitched up. This was not long after the latest tourist drive had taken off with a verve, and some might say short-sightedness to match the Victorians. The North Coast 500, billed as the ultimate road trip round Scotland, and sponsored by who else, Aston Martin with the promise of the best dolphin viewpoint in Scotland and watching salmon leap upstream. 
included within the 500, 516 mile loop was the Bilak Navar. And so for the first time driving that notorious single track road, we shared it with a cavalcade of bikers, endurance cyclists, motorhomes and petrol heads in classic cars. My feelings were mixed. As Shepard noted of her beloved Cairngorms in the 1977 foreword to The Living Mountain, written 30 years after she first penned the masterpiece. Too many boots, too much commotion, but then how much uplift for how many hearts? Later, a local who ran a small farm shop out of his garage told me that accidents were on the rise and the BLAC was unable to withstand the traffic. Not for the first time, though perhaps it was the first in Scotland, I wondered if the best way to love a place was to not go there at all. It's Thank lovely. You. It takes me, uh, I, I feel like I've been on that journey with you late spring 2017 when you're heavily pregnant as well. Kathleen, what does it feel like? Um, does that get to the essence of what you were looking for in these books? This just beautiful, very individual experience of a place and you get a bit of history there and a bit of the geology of the place as well. A blend. I, I don't um, like the term nature writing because I don't really think it exists. I'm really interested in the point where nature and culture meet. You know, nature, culture and to an extent travel. And I think Chitra Space does that perfectly, you know. And I that, sorry. most of the people do, do just home in on that. People know instinctively where, where to go with it. And a piece of so-called nature writing, which didn't include a human experience, be that of being pregnant, you know, other women's experiences, would be negligent, I think. You know, it would be, I can't say a lie, but it would be missing a huge part of what it is to be alive in the world, you know. So that's my, that's my beef. Well, let me move on to you, Amanda, and nature, culture, things that, of course, occur to you in your everyday work as well. Tell us about where you wrote about, what the experience was that you wrote about, and then we'll have a little reading from you as well. I wrote about a trip I made on a boat to Mingali, which is in the far outer reaches of the West Coast. Um, very far it's not outer reaches. Very far out, yeah. It's not an <laughs> island you can get to easily and I went on it as part of a trip with um, Cape Farewell which was a, an organisation which kind of looked at the cultural issues in relation to climate change um, and actually there's another piece in the book by um, I think Kareen Polwart kind of talks about um, Cape Farewell voyaging as well. Um, but what was really, I mean this was a trip that I took in 2012 or 2013 I think but what's incredible about it for me is that I still hold it very very close and very dear to my heart it, it, it was a trip that um changed me in some kind of way and I'm not quite sure what kind of way it did but I think it, it is one of these moments of time that just you kind of you hold very dear and probably will hold very dear um for the rest of your life actually mm. so I might just read yes. a couple of Go minutes from that, that's okay. Set, if you want to set the scene or do you want to dive right in there? Whatever you like. Well, I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to start from the beginning of the story. Okay. Which sets Seems the scene like a good place to begin. This time. Glasses on, yep. Glasses on, good to go. <laughs> Within minutes of the boat leaving the harbour at Malig, I felt an untethering from ordinary life and place. The song of the whale sailed low and close to the water. The mainland receded only slowly and any land masses before us only gradually came into focus with an altered point of view. Egg became unrecognisable as egg from the north and sky from the southwest became a fortress. Due west, Mingale would emerge over the far horizon, first as a watery presence, only slowly becoming solid. This was an unhurried traversal, hours and hours of watching and looking, flick at skies, no phones, no internet, Sheer waters skimmed the waves in black to white to black lines. Posses of guillemots bobbed in the swell and skittered away or ducked under as we passed. Queens of puffins, solitary tasties. I was on a 74 foot long sailing boat, traveling around some islands with a group of people, most of whom would remain strangers, while two would become good friends. It's a trip that stays with me, in, in part because of the experience of slow journeying and hours only slowly unfolding. Days spent sitting, watching, thinking. We must have talked too, 
but I can't remember any specificities of conversation at all. On these islands, the past, present and future are intimately intertwined and each island offers up all times if we know what to look for. There are abandoned crofts and townships where roofs and walls have fallen and sand and nature or the macher have encroached over doorways and into the crevices between their stones. There are standing stones in prehistoric settlements, peat banks that have been worked for generations, the remains of old field systems that we can see when a low sun casts its shadows, rusting cars and ploughs and tractors, all testament to the longevity of human occupation and influence. On Cana, there's a Celtic cross from around the 8th century, which is broken, so I was told, because it was used for target practice during the Napoleonic Wars. There's a bittersweet tension between humans and nature that is sometimes balanced, sometimes lost. Cana's shearwater population was decimated because of the rats that came to the island, stowaways on boats over a, over a century ago. Since the extermination of all 10,000 of them, the seabird colonies have seen a resurgence. Likewise, the rabbit population without predation exploded and was perhaps upwards of 16,000 before thousands were culled in 2014. The rabbits not only affected agriculture on the island, but their burrowing threatened to destroy the archaeological remains of humans who, though long gone, have less traces hidden beneath the surface. Beautiful and gives us an idea of what you're, you're talking about there, that sense of a very slow journey, very little conversation, but incredibly intense friendships made with just a few people and it still resonates and stays with you. I'm wondering as an artist and as a printmaker primarily, mm -hmm. is, the, is the creative process a starting point for you, Amanda, the same when you're writing about a place as when you're recording it visually? I think it is, and actually, if you look at most of my sketchbooks, they tend to have more writing than drawing in them. Um, so, yeah, and I think what's interesting is you never quite know what sticks in your head at the time. There's something about what remains after what, and what resonates after and what you want to respond to and create with. And I think what's really interesting for me now, reading what I read about Mingali in that trip was actually, there's something about this almost enforced time spent, wherever we are staying, that actually opens up this possibility of slow journeying at home. You know, we've kind of slow journeyed through the seasons this year, and it's actually been quite incredible to be quite stationary and watch as life and the world and everything unfolds in lots and lots of different ways. Incredible, challenging as well as creative, though. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I think there'll be, you know, as I say, sometimes the urge to write or the urge to make art comes weeks, months, maybe years after the fact. And I think where we are today, it'll be really interesting to see what evolves from this period and this year, kind of, in years to come, because I think a lot of people haven't found it easy to be creative at this point in time, you know, but there's still something that percolates away. I, I think you're onto something. Uh, Kathleen and, and Chitter might agree as well that, you know, this is going to be very interesting what this enforced slowing down and shrinking of our world will do to people like yourselves. But before I go any further, this is a great book. If you fancy buying it, there's a button at the bottom of your screen. Did I mention that before? Anyway, it's by Canon Gate. It's a lovely book. If you thought you didn't like nature write, writing, read this book. Can I pick up on what I've just said there with you, um, Chitra? Do you think that because of the weird experience of 2020, people like you are going to have uh, an absolutely rich seam to mine for the, the coming years? Um, or is it more intimidating I, because you're not going out and about and doing as much? Well, I think it's interesting. I, I think it's kind of both and neither at the same time. I, I, I agree that I think in the midst, there, there is that feeling, isn't there, at the moment that we are inside uh, this extraordinary moment of change. So it's really hard to look out from that from that vantage point. There's there's almost nothing to see but chaos. Mm. Um, so it's hard to create uh, in the midst of that. Um, on the other hand, when life is kind of squeezed so much and when um, you start to really realize the things that matter, um, and I think this has been such a time of, of kind of, of tragedy, 
um, that I think it makes you your kind of your powers of focus this idea that I know Kathleen writes about in the introduction so beautifully this kind of almost like a bearing witness it, it starts to feel really political um, and I feel that really really strongly um, because there is a kind of futility in kind of wielding a pen in a, in a pandemic you know you're not you're not a key worker, are you, frankly? Oh, I could um, argue maybe and, you and are. You're, you're providing psychological solace and somewhere for us all to <laughs> go and do something to get away from this hell. Well, I think there is a sense definitely of um, that you have to do what you can do. And if that thing is wielding the pen or, or the laptop, then I know for myself as a writer, from what I'm working on at the moment, um, the project that you maybe thought was too big, too frightening, um, too political, too difficult, is no longer one to be pushed aside. It's the one that you do now. Um, so, yeah, my priorities feel very clear right now. Interesting. Kathleen, what, what about that point, the creativity of being in this odd moment? Um, it is an odd moment, and, and I'm finding it difficult to be creative. Yeah. Another word, I'm not sure what it means, but I think it's right. But we, things can take 30 years. I have written pieces that have been 30 years in the making, and you just learn now is not the moment, and then one day now is the moment, you know. And it takes a certain courage to do that because the honest is always on it. Like, obviously, we might not be here tomorrow, but to allow that space and that time to happen takes a certain bravery as well, you know. But um, sitting here writing poems, that's not happening. You know. You're really finding it difficult. I was anyway. I haven't, I haven't been writing much recent, in recent years anyhow. I think um, my own life's changing. But um, yeah. yeah, it was so perverse to be sitting here writing poems about a pandemic somehow. It just, we just have to feel this moment, feel our way through it. You know, a couple of years, see what's, you know, what's in the making now. How it all shakes down. You're going to do another reading for us. I mean, there are so many. In fact, before you do that, there are so many wonderful contributions in this book. Do you want to give it? I don't want to give everyone the limelight and miss people out, but are there one or two shout outs that you just think, oh, come on, these are just wonderful? It's tricky. There's 20 um, writers and two visual artists in the book, and the book contains um, prose narrative, such as we've heard, also poetry, kind of experimental poetry as well. We've got a rather um, wry dictionary, Alec Finley's um, Place of Our Dictionary. It's, I, I did want diversity in all sorts, and that meant diversity of form as well. And obviously I'm not going to exclude the poets from, from anything. <laughs> of course not. So you're going to read, aren't you? Uh, I think it's The Mirror you've chosen. I've chosen one called The Mirror by M. Strang. The Mirror. If you're strong enough to hear it, the blackbird has flown into the house. It's a hot, airless day and the back door was left wide for the bird. It's indisputable. The dark blue door, its open width and the matte black of the bird's coat, his burnt wings and sun-ringed eye. If you're strong enough to hear it, the blackbird has flown upstairs. He has followed the smell of water and is listening to the streaming light from his perch on the lip of the sink. Here he meets his double, meets his double, and dances for the benefit of all blackbirds. He is looking and seeing, hopping and waiting for the other to disappear or die. Lovely, lovely stuff. Uh, let me ask you, Amanda, have you had the chance to go through the entire book and, and read it, be honest, <laughs> or have you just been oh, I... getting on with your work? Yes, I have, and actually, what I found, what I loved about it was just the different connections that people make and have made in it. So there's, quite often there's a starting point of personal experience, but that personal experience will take people back to look at history, sometimes go back into prehistory. Sometimes there's a kind of speculation towards the future, sometimes there's there's a kind of extrapolation which makes links that you wouldn't kind of otherwise necessarily have made, you know, so there's something really lovely about that breadth of knowledge that people bring in that's rooted in personal experience. So, you know, I'm thinking about um, 
Jim Crumley's piece about sea eagles that brings in the Tomb of the Eagles in Orkney that talks about the, um, the decline of sea eagles as a population in Scotland with the numbers of versus the numbers of golden eagles that talks in kind of questions of reintroduction and kind of modern conservation you know so there's a whole range of different things that are encapsulated in so many of these different pieces in the book so and I it's, would, so, I would, it's so yeah. difficult as well isn't it that's what I love about it you just don't know what's coming on the next page and just when you were talking there Amanda about um, personal experience I was thinking about Chitra's meditation on the pigeon and for some reason that really got me it was really emotional um, you can give us a little bit of context for that story Chitra yeah, um, so it's, yeah, I, I found that one really, really emotional to write, actually. Um, so it's really about a very specific period in, in parenting where, you know, my son was about two years old and your, your head's slowly coming up again, you know, you're, you're back in the world a little bit, but you're still caring for, for this toddler and, you know, you your view of the world is, is very much through your own windows. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not going out hiking at the weekends. You're not, you know, you're not massively even seeing trees anywhere other than in your local park where you're kind of watching your son open and close a gate in the rain for two hours. <laughs> um, and so, you know, vast amounts of patience are required at this stage of parenting. And um, what's really amazing is it's also an education in, in how to look at nature and, and the world and those kind of intersections. And I, I don't think I had paid such close attention to the world um, for decades, since I was a child, to be perfectly honest, um, until I became a, a mother, a parent. And then at the same time, um, around that same time when my son was two, I was starting to think that he might be autistic. And this pigeon came and landed one day on our on our windowsill. And me and my son just looked at it together for about half an hour. It may have even, I think it was even up to an hour actually, which is such a long time, both when you're looking after a child and you know, when you're looking at something in nature, it's a really long time. And um, there was something about this, this moment and what it taught me um, about my son and this future but at, in that moment was quite frightening um, but now that you know um, I'm on the other side of it uh, I can just see it for the kind of lovely moment that it was it was a very hopeful um, moment really and I love yeah. the way you say you know you still think about every day when you, when you looked out at that ledge you remembered that pigeon yeah, this, yeah this absolutely the and the other thing as well um, and again this goes back to you know a question of what what is nature what constitutes nature writing I wanted to write about autism as a kind of natural phenomenon because you know science intersects with nature as well and this idea of the kind of the mysteries of my son's brain um, it is part of nature too um, so I wanted to kind of revel in that as well Kathleen, I wonder what you think of that, the whole thing. It can be personal, but also radical and political, the writing in this book. And that's what's so wonderful about it, under cover of the nature theme. Isn't that funny? Do you think it's a flag of convenience? I don't know. I'm beginning to suspect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. I think it's the most, surely to goodness, the most important changes, the most frightening changes that are happening to us are happening in our relationship with the natural world, you know. For God's sakes, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, which we believe has been coming at us because we're interfering with the natural world and getting too pushing animals out of their, their habitats. So this is real and it's happening. So surely to goodness, the most radical thing we can do is pay attention, do something about it, listen, think, notice, you know. And as a, as a writer, it pleases me to think that this is what we, you know, here assembled, this is what we can do. I think it was you, Claire, who spoke about wielding the pen. Yeah. Well, if that's what we do, that's what we do, yeah. Does it, does it feel like a political act for you, Amanda, when you're writing something and actually just producing art? It's a statement about all sorts of things. It's, it's, it's yeah, I, th I think the word political is loaded. Um, I think that you, make whatever form to communicate something and I think it can be overtly political or it can sit 
as a question. And sometimes the kind of writing and art that I like best in a way kind of ask questions or makes me think about something differently or draws connections I wouldn't necessarily have thought of myself. Mm. And I think a lot of the, you, you, maybe the question is what's not political, you know? Yep, Actually. absolutely. Well, here, here are some questions. Look, I've got some here on this little gizmo here. I hope it doesn't cut out me. I'm just amazed the technology is holding together, chaps, and no dogs have breezed into the room. So let me put some of the questions from people that have been watching us out there. Uh, let's see. PYKB says, ever since Sir Ewan Cameron killed the last wolf in Scotland in 1680, they've been extinct in this country. What does the panel feel about the reintroduction of animals that have been historically extinguished by the hands of humankind? Who wants to pick up that political hot potato? <laughs> I'm going to go to the editor curator first because I can't. Very much. No, I think it's a question for a naturalist. And, and, More of a naturalist uh, question. Just not, not a writer. Anyone like to field that one? Or should we? I think we, actually it probably is. So we're going to get Elaine O now. Nature writing, she says, has changed from being written by white males. <laughs> well, there we are. We've got proof positive of that. Now there are many females and people of colour writing about nature and travel. Sometimes it seems as though the writers are on a quest to find out something about themselves. Amy Liptrot, for example. Uh, could we get comments from each of you on that? Let's start with you, Amanda. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what's lovely is the range of people writing about nature is different. So you're picking up on different themes and experiences, whether it's to do with race or gender or sexuality or pregnancy or age or all these different things. You know, th there's so many things that impact on our experience of place. And I think it's really important to know and understand and I, th I think that there's elements of writing where you are writing to find out about yourself but I think there's other elements of writing where you want to convey your experience or to say look this is happening to me and this is a legitimate thing and I would like you to think about what it's like not to be you in this environment so I think all of these kind of ways of kind of considering place and nature and culture and where we are and the interfaces between them all are really, really important. And I think, you know, in terms of diversity within writing, you know, I think it's hopefully it'll be something that will just exponentially kind of increase, actually. And I think some of the stuff that was happening after the Black Lives Matter, you know, um, and these kind of questions of asked of the publishing industry of the art world you know all of these questions now kind of sit there much much more overtly than they've sat for a while though for people of color these questions have kind of been there in our lives kind of for years let you me know, ask so you that about that chitra's chitra's nodding along let me bring her in here yeah yeah i yeah i completely agree um with with what amanda said particularly towards the end there um i think what really sort of bugs me and what I didn't want to do here um, is I think when for example people of colour enter into the field of nature writing it all can feel a bit circumscribed um, so what what it's almost like what is maybe being expected of us or at least what we feel might be expected of us is to write a kind of you know examination of what our relationship to the land is and and it will be about you know history and it's about belonging and it's a, it, it feels like you know we, we aren't just allowed to kind of strike out and to, to to go on that walk and to marvel at what we're seeing around us you know there has to be some kind of you know issue at play here and um and, and I find that really irritating actually. I, I don't want to be told um how to do it or or how other people might like to receive it. Um so I, I really decided that I didn't want to write a kind of thesis about you know what it's like to be a brown person going for a walk in Scotland um, but <laughs> instead to um, that's not in any way to say that it doesn't inform everything and it isn't a part of everything but I years ago because you know my, my day job really is I'm a journalist and um, 
years ago, I interviewed the writer, Alan Hollinghurst. I went to his house and I interviewed him. He was absolutely amazing. And he talked about, you know, when he wrote his first novel, The Swimming Pool Library, how he decided that he was just gonna, from the very first line, do what the straight white man does, which is just take it for his own, not explain a thing to anybody and just go for it, <laughs> you know, just kind of seize it and take it and, and make it what he wanted. And, and that's what I, I found that really inspiring. So it's like, you know, I'm not going to explain to you what, what gay life in 1980s London is like. I'm just going to assume that you're probably a gay guy in London reading this and you know it already. Um, and I think that's really powerful. It's not how everyone wants to do it, but it's yep. definitely how I approach things. Not having well. to frame it and prepare it. I should remind everyone watching, it's Antlers of Water, edited by Kathleen <laughs> Jamie, who's down at the bottom of the screen. Did I mention you can buy this book? Um, it's from Canongate. It's very nice. It's a wonderful uh, anthology of writing. Another question in here, <laughs> it's uh, Sue Reid. Is there a distinctive Scottish idea of nature? The highlands are visible from the centre of Edinburgh, city and wilderness so close to each other. Kathleen. That's what I, I was wondering um, when, I, when I put the book together, if when all these pieces came in, if we could be identifying uh, I, I uniquely Scottish way of doing this. And I'm not sure we can, except that, you know, it's our take on it. So. Yeah, there's another one here, Elizabeth Kay. Do you see nature writing, this is for anyone, uh, nature writing, especially when it raises questions about the climate crisis as a form of activism? I'll throw that one to you, Amanda. I know you don't like the political thing, but it is activism, isn't it? <laughs> I, think it I think it is, and I think it, it's, it's trying to find our own way to be active in the world, and I think writing can form part of that activism. Um, there's some people, as I said before, that are more kind of overt with it than others. Mm. But that's not to say that the kind of, you know, the quieter pieces aren't as important. And actually, just to get back to what Trita was saying about that last point, you know, I think there's something overtly political, potentially, about being particular kinds of people in a landscape. And, you know, um, you don't necessarily have to say, here is my experience, but for diversity to exist as how we write about things, what we say about things, how we contextualize things, I think can be really important in terms of that activism and taking up that space and having that space and that voice in an environment that you can be listened to. I've got one for you, Chitra, because I know you've got two young children. Uh, Sandra M says, would you agree it's important to engage children at primary school with the natural world? And this should be part of the curriculum. Let's not be political, but let's just think about that. Yeah, I do. I think that that's hugely important. And I, I do, you know, along with everyone else, um, find it really tragic that, you know, the things that, that I did with such ease in my own childhood, which was, you know, we're only talking, I'm 40 now, so only like 30, 35 years ago. Um, you know, even things like going and catching tadpoles or like going out at night and looking into streams on school trips and things. It's just not part of uh, childhood experience now in the same way, certainly not in the in city life. Um, and I think it's an absolute tragedy and I, it, it's part of that bigger tragedy that, you know, so many of those species aren't there. It's harder to find as well, isn't it? Um, it's not so much the only problem. It's not the only problem is that we're not doing enough of it. It's also that there is less of it to do, um, which is, you know, part of living in, in this time of, you know, the, the sixth extinction. Let me ask you about that, Kathleen, if you think there's a place in the curriculum for primary school children to learn about nature and poetry, you know, as part of part and parcel of what they get in their education, it sets them up for life. It's a, it's a staggering question that we don't. I know. We, <laughs> you know what, what is education about if not to find our way in the world, negotiate our way in the world, and we ignore the world? It's, it's, it's extraordinary to me that... that it just, it just doesn't happen. I'm, I'm now having flashbacks to my own primary school classroom with this wee nature table in the corner. And, you know, and 
you know, you say guddling around with caterpillars and tadpoles and whatnot, you know, and it's not there. No, it's weird. It's weird. Heather, I think a, a reckoning is happening, isn't there, around, not so much around that, but I feel it's part of the same issue about the way that history has been taught in schools for so long and just these kind of gross omissions in terms of, you know, the history of colonialism, for example, or, you know, um, and I actually see it as it's all part of the same thing. Um, yeah. And we are, yeah, we're failing at all of it, frankly. Let, it's Kathleen. cheery, isn't it? Yeah, it's very cheery. I know we're getting a bit apocalyptic. <laughs> Kathleen, you wanted to jump in there. I, I, I struggle to explain what I mean by political, but I think that that's it. It's definitely part of the same move and the same reappraisal of what on earth we've been up to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I wish we had longer. We could really go for a <laughs> Well, while we're being so apocalyptic, here's one from John G. Uh, there has been a lot of changes in the Scottish landscape over the last 50 years. What do you think it might look like in another 50 years' time? Oof. That's a head scratcher. Amanda, have you got any oh. worries about this? <laughs> well, hopefully we'll still be here. We hope. We hope we'll still be able to make those trips to Mingley in places that you've been to. But do you think it is going to change? I don't know, but I, I, actually, I think Twitter had a, a lovely line about do we care for these places best by not travelling as much and going as much? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what... Um, the landscape will look like in 50 years. Do you know, there's, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the kind of regeneration of trees. You know, the kind of, they're, they're planning to plant a lot more native species of trees in the countryside, but at the same time, the A9's being jeweled. So, it's, you know, there may or may not be more wind farms, there might be off more offshore wind farms as we move to more, more of that kind of um, um, power. But I think it's, it's really impossible to tell. I don't know if we were to look back 50 years, we would think it would look as it does now. I don't know what anybody else thinks. I think 50 years ago, the idea of sitting in our separate houses, being beamed into each other's rooms by something called the internet, you know, or Zoom, we would never, ever, ever have imagined this. Absolutely not. It's, it's absolutely discombobulating to think about it in those terms. I've got one more here. Uh, Linda W says, what are your personal wishes and ambitions for your local natural environment, your local natural environment, and for the wildlife to thrive there? Now, we know you love a pigeon, Chitra, but is there any other form of the natural world that you would like to be able to thrive where you live in Leith? Well, going back to the pandemic, it's been quite interesting to see how, and this isn't just, you know, locally where I live in Leith, we'll all have noticed that because obviously the council's been doing so much less kind of clearing work, um, that so many of the kind of the verges and the roadsides and um, even just around bins and bollards, uh, nature is just like finding its way. And it all looks quite kind of messy and springing up. And I don't know if I quite buy into this idea that you know nature's had a break while we've been under lockdown and it's kind of flourished I don't unfortunately think that things happen that quickly but it is interesting that maybe our perspective has changed and I certainly have noticed this kind of um, nature finding its way a little bit more in the very immediate local community what we would have considered maybe a few months ago to be kind of messy and unkempt and we're now maybe seeing a little bit more in the way of like the the wildflower meadow um, and all of the advantages that that brings and the coming of the bees and the birds and and I definitely think you know that people are for those of us who have got you know the luck of having a little bit of outside space we've got a tiny little garden um, and you know we have been putting so much work into it and, um, and so I think, yeah, allotments and gardens and outside space is being kind of cherished um, in a different way. I mean, Leaf Links um, has just been an absolute lifeline. It really has.
Gosh, we're running out Everybody. of time, guys. We're running out of time, I'm afraid. And I, I would love to ask loads more questions and find out more about the natural world around your houses and what you want to conserve. But I want to say it's been such a weird but lovely experience seeing you all in your boxes, <laughs> talking to the three of you, Kathleen, Jamie, Chitra, Ramaswamy and Amanda Thompson. Many thanks for your time and your absolutely beautiful work. Antlers of Water is published by Canongate. You can pick up copies online from the shop.edbookfest.co.uk site among, with a myriad other fantastic fantastic books. Please remember this year's festival is free of charge. If you've enjoyed this event, we sincerely hope you have. We'd love you to consider making a donation. It'd be great if you could do that for the Edinburgh International Book Festival so that they can continue to do this sort of great work, uh, putting on brilliant, stimulating and much needed time uh, entertainment in times like these. But finally, I'd like to say, and very importantly, thanks to you for joining us for this online event. We appreciate it's all very weird. We support the supporters there, even if we can't see the whites of your eyes. We all appreciate it from all of us as well. To all of you, thank you.